That's good. Good stuff. It's good to be back on the stage. It's weird to be out for so long, but it's good to be back. You know, this morning, I want to take you back to the basics. You know, that term uh, is, is used when someone starts to overcomplicate something or someone begins to overthink something. We say to that person, hey, let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to the basics. And this morning, that's my desire, is to take us back to the basics. The basics are the foundation, really, to successful living. In every area of our lives, if we could go back to the basics, it's the foundation, it's the building blocks to successful living. No great athlete ever became great without first learning the basics of his sport, right? No, no, no great author has ever written great works of literature without the basics of the alphabet. You know, no, no uh, inventions, you know, would be accomplished or completed or invented without the basics of science and engineering. The basics are the foundations. They're the building blocks that we build upon to reach great accomplishments. Without the basics and foundations, we leave things to chance. When I was growing up, my dad, he was a, a really good athlete, a great athlete, and, um, and when I was growing up, he coached a lot of my sports. He coached from the time I was in Little League till the time I was in high school. In fact, I just talked to my dad yesterday, and he said that my grandma bought him his Christmas gift early. She bought him a, a, a basketball hoop to go in the driveway because he just Put, laid some new cement in his driveway and so he put out this basketball hoop and he's been playing basketball every day for the last week and um, and so I don't know he's 65 66 somewhere in there and uh, playing basketball every day and and, and he said something to me that was so funny because I had already written this in my notes he said you know it, it's like riding a bike you go back to the basics my dad was a stickler for the basics and the fundamentals. As a coach, he would always take the team back to the basics and the fundamentals because he knew it didn't matter if you were 6'5 and a fantastic athlete. If you didn't know the basics, you were no good to the team. You have to know the basics to be successful. I think of a couple of years ago, I took some of my nephews I, we, between my sisters and stuff there's there's uh for my parents there is I think 19 grandkids and, and and so I have a few nephews and and I remember a couple of years ago I took a couple of them out in the yard to play catch to play football and this was when they were younger probably eight nine years old and we went out in the yard and we took the football out there and we started playing catch and if you've ever played catch with a nine-year-old boy then you know how it goes you get about three good throws in and three solid catches in and then something shifts in the little boy's mind because that's just a little too boring all of a sudden you throw a basic pass and the next thing you know is this little boy launches himself off of the ground goes vertical with the ground his legs go flying out his arms get stretched out and he tries to make this dramatic catch usually it doesn't happen the ball hits the ground, the boy hits the ground, the ball goes flying. And then my nephews were well known for doing this. They would then give me the replay for what I just saw. And if you've ever had a replay with a little boy, it goes something like this. Did you see that? I was like, whoosh, whoosh, ah. and then I grab the ball and I'm oh, like this. And it's real dramatic and I'm sitting watching my nephews going, yeah, I just saw it without all the sound effects. And I hate to tell you, it really wasn't that cool. But I'm just thinking that in my head, you know, you really don't want to tell a nine-year-old boy that. So instead you say something like, oh, that's awesome. Let's just do it again. Throw me the ball. We'll do it again. See, the basic catch, I get it. For a little boy, it's just boring. It's just boring to just play simple catch. They want the dramatic the dramatic makes the highlights. The dramatic is entertaining. The dramatic uh, um, is something that, you know, you can replay over and over again. And so they watch this on TV with their 
great athletes that they love and, and they see it and so then they want to replay it. But the reality is this, the dramatic doesn't win games, the basics and the fundamentals do. The dramatic makes the highlight real, but the fundamentals win the games. If a boy can't learn to make a simple, basic catch, he's never going to be a superstar. And this morning, as we begin into the basics, you know, we've been playing this game of life. We've been playing to win. We've been playing hard. But the truth is, the reality is, every one of us in this room has stories that we could share, has situations in our lives about how maybe the ball's been dropped, maybe the ball's been fumbled, maybe things are just hard, maybe you're at the point where you just feel like sitting on the bench for the while, or you just feel like quitting, or you feel like life, the game has just got too hard, and, and, and you're tired of the plays where it's the Hail Mary, and so you're getting worn out, and so this morning, and, and for the next few weeks, I think the Holy Spirit's saying, let's just take a time out, let's just take a time out, from all the plays, from all the fanciness of our Christian walk with God, and let's just take a time out, let's get the ball out, and let's just work on the basics. Let's work on the basic things and make sure that we're able to catch the ball before we try the fancy stuff. You know, if I were to take you into my office, I have a small library in the office, and Perhaps maybe you're thinking of one of those situations in your life where maybe the ball's just being fumbled or you feel like you just can't get it all together. And so you come and make an appointment and you come into my office. I could sit you down and we could talk about the situation. And and after we talked about the situation, I could take you to the small library in my office or to the library down the hall here. And we could pick out some books for your situation. There's countless books on health and healing. And I could take you to those books and pull those off the shelf and say, hey, here's a really good book that somebody wrote on healing and I could hand that to you. Maybe it's a situation in your marriage. I could say, hey, here's a really good book or a really good class that we offer or a series on marriage. Here you go. Here it is. This is, man, this is the Hail Mary pass for your marriage. You need this. This is the play that you need. Here you go. Go ahead and read this. I could take you in there and maybe there's things going on and and you're just having a tough time parenting your kids, whatever age or level that is. You never stop being a parent. And so you go in there and you you say, do you have a book on parenting? And we grab a book on parenting and say, here, you need this for your your kid. He's, He's way out there. Go ahead and read this. This will help you reel them in. And I could give you a lot of good books because the truth of the matter is we live in a day and age where we have more resources and more books and more Christian knowledge than we, we've ever had before. And it's all available to us. And it's all really, really good. But here's the simple truth. If you don't have the basics to your Christian faith, this walk with God is going to be tough. His walk with God is going to be difficult. And so you could read all the books in the world, but if you don't have the basics, you're going to struggle. So perhaps you're here today and you've been coming maybe for a few weeks, maybe you've been coming for a while, maybe this is your first time here, and you're saying, man, I need the basics, I need these things in my life, these next few weeks are for you. But maybe you're seasoned. Maybe you're a seasoned Christian and you've been here for a while and you've been serving God for a long time, for many years in your life. And truth of the matter is you could preach up here because you're seasoned in your faith with God. Truth is you could teach any class for our Sunday schools or our Wednesday nights. Well, this is a refresher course for you. And I want you to treat it like I'm treating it, where sometimes we just need to stop coaching the team and we need to get on the field and put a little of the basics into practice again in our life. How many of you know that those coaches, when you watch football this afternoon, those coaches, they can coach really well, but if they were to get on the field and actually try and run one of those plays, they would probably struggle because they don't practice the basics every day. And so this is just a great refresher course getting back to the basics. I want to dive in. We're going to turn to Matthew or Mark, I'm sorry. We're going to turn to Mark chapter 5 
Mark chapter 5, and I just want to open in some prayer. And Lord, I believe that your word speaks truth to us. God, I believe that as we get back to the basics, you reveal, Lord God, so many things and truths about yourself, Lord God. And as we begin to apply the basics, the fundamentals, Lord God, to our lives in our walk with you, that God, you reveal to us great things and you do amazing works and you help us to win the everyday events in our lives. And so, Lord, we want to dive into the basics. I pray that, Lord, as we read from your word, that you'll, review, uh, that you'll refresh uh, and give us new revelation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 5. Here in Mark chapter 5, we're going to discover a man and a woman who are in great trouble. This man and this woman, they have reached a point in their life where their daughter, their 12-year-old daughter, is very, very sick and she's actually dying. She's on her deathbed and they are desperate for help. They've exhausted all of their resources as parents. They've called in all the doctors. The doctors weren't able to do anything. They've exhausted their financial resources in regard to getting help for their daughter. They've tried everything they know to do. They've, they've tried religion and its practices and it hasn't panned out for them. And so they are desperate for help and their little girl is dying. You know, think about that for a moment. If you're a parent, step into their shoes for just a second and imagine if your child was at the point of death. Just a couple of days ago, just two nights ago, uh, we got, uh, my dad got a phone call from one of my cousins who their little girl who had been sick for, uh, since birth really had passed away. And that's hard. You know, we talked about that as a family and we said, you know, what's difficult is you can understand when somebody's lived a long, full life and they pass away and they're ready and anticipating going home to be with the Father and and, and, and you know that their life has been full and so you just pray that their passing is peaceful but when it's a child it's always hard and it's always difficult I heard a story about a pastor whose son had been really sick he was about six years old very very sick was dying they too had come to the end of their rope and 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 they had come to the place where they took the boy home they took him home from the hospital the doctors basically said take him home you know he doesn't have long to live they took him home and uh, after several days of being home and just waiting for him to to pass the little boy realized that he wasn't getting any better he was old enough to know that I'm not getting any better he was un old enough to understand death and he said to his dad one night he said dad what's it like to die can you imagine as a parent having to explain to your six-year-old son what it's going to be like to die? He choked back the tears. He swallowed hard. He prayed a simple prayer and said, God, what do I say to my son? And then he thought of this. He said, son, you know how night after night you've been uh, sleeping on the couch and you, and you fall asleep to the TV. And after you fall asleep, your dad, I come in and I pick you up. And I carry you to a room that I've prepared for you. And I've made it just for you. It's your bedroom and I carry you there and I place you in your bed. Well, one day, son, you're going to fall asleep. And when you die, it's not going to be me who picks you up. It's going to be Jesus who's going to pick you up and he's going to take you to a place that he's prepared for you. I think to myself, wow, I can only imagine what that conversation must have been like for that parent. It's a great depiction of what death is, but I can, my heart goes out to any parent who's facing those kind of uh, scenarios with a child. And here in Mark chapter 5, we find two parents who are at this point of desperation with Jesus. And they, just, they know that their daughter is dying. And what do you do when your daughter's dying? What do you do when life gets difficult? The circumstances are tough. What do you do when the precious things in your life are lost? What do you do when you are desperate? 
Well, I thought about that, and I thought, what do you do? And I think when it comes to Jesus and our relationship with Him, we always should go back to the basics. Always go back to the fundamentals. And, and, and so here we go in Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. It says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around Him while He was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Here is this respected synagogue leader. Everything he has tried to do to save his daughter has failed. But he knows one thing. He knows this. If I can find this Jesus, if I can find this man who saves, this man who heals, he can heal my daughter. So he decides to put his faith and his daughter's fate in the hands of of Jesus. And so the first basic, the first foundation to our faith walk with God is to put our trust in Jesus. Seek Jesus. That's the first foundation is we have to be a person or a people that learn to seek Jesus as Jairus did. Jairus proved his faith in Jesus by seeking him. Seeking Jesus and putting our faith in Jesus is the foundation for all of our relationship with God. And everyone said? No, everybody said, duh. Duh, Pastor Rob. We already get it. We already know that. We already know that. Thanks for this deep revelation. Man, how long did that take you to figure out that, you know, the foundation to your faith is seeking Jesus? You know, wow, that's brilliant. Hours in prayer. Thank you. We pay you for this? What in the world is going on? That's what's circling in your head, seeking Jesus. But yet the reality is this do we really? We become really good at being good religious leaders, exhausting all other resources in our lives before we seek Jesus. Before we seek Jesus, even though we're believers, we look for other solutions, such as we're dealing with a situation in our finances and we say to ourselves, you know what, I'm dealing with the situation. I got all these bills I got to pay. You know what, I'm going to do some research. I'm going to find some more information. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to look online. I'm going to Google it. I'm going to find some information to help me out of this situation. And we seek information. Other times we seek counsel. We, which it isn't a bad thing. Seeking these things are not a bad thing. But we say, you know what? I, I got this situation going on in my family. I'm going to give a friend a call. I'm going to give a life group leader a call. I'm going to call the pastor. I'm going to call my parents. I'm going to call somebody. I'm going to seek some counsel. I'm going to figure out how I need to get past this situation. I'm going to seek a counselor. I'm going to call somebody. I'm going to get some therapy. I'm going to seek some of this. And we seek that instead of seeking Jesus. We look for advice, we seek advice, we go around, we ask people, hey, I heard you went through this same kind of situation. Hey, what did you do to get out of this situation? We seek advice. None of these are bad, but another thing that we oftentimes do is we run from the problem or the situation or the solution. You know, we run from it instead of seeking Jesus. We oftentimes ignore it. You know, my own experience has shown me that most Christians, not all, are really good at not seeking Jesus until our ministries are almost dead, our sick are on their deathbeds, the people we love are pursuing sin that leads to death, etc., etc. And so I would beg to say, I would, I would say that most, not all, are just like this synagogue leader. We've exhausted all other resources and whatever it is in our life has reached the point where we know it's about to die, it's about to be over, it's about to be finished. And so now what am I going to do? I'm going to seek Jesus. It's a last resort instead of our first response. You know, the reason coaches teach the basics and practice the fundamentals is so that it comes natural 
to the athlete. So they don't have to think about it on the field so that when a, when, when a, a football player is running to catch a pass, he's not thinking to himself, watch the ball into my hands, tuck it in. He's not thinking any of that. It's just natural. In the moments, notice, even when the ball is not supposed to be passed to him and it's whizzing by his head, the natural response is, ball, hands, into my pocket. I'm going to run for the touchdown. It's a natural response. But Christians, oftentimes, sadly, after we find salvation, we stop seeking Jesus. And it's not a natural response to say, this is going on. I need to seek Jesus. Where is Jesus? Instead, it's, I need to find information. I need to find counsel. I need to find advice. I need more money. I need this. And when all else fails, I seek Jesus. You know, I hope today is a time when we would begin to develop in us, all of us, me definitely included, a basic response that in every situation, good or bad, that says, I have faith in Jesus, let's go find him. That when my wife comes to tell me something bad is taking place, my knee-jerk response is, I have faith in Jesus, let's go find him. When someone comes to me with marital issues, I say, I have faith in Jesus, let's go find Him. When there is a reason to celebrate, I, I, I have faith in Jesus, let's go tell Him. When someone is sick, I have faith in Jesus, let's take you to Jesus. May this be the basic instinct of us as believers, to seek Him first. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added to you. Oftentimes we look for the added to us first. And then when it's not added to us, what do we do? Then we go and seek the kingdom of God. We've got to reverse that process. Seek Jesus first. Then all the things are added to us. You know, there's no one in this room that has truly sought Jesus and not found Him. Because the Bible says very clearly, as you seek, you will find. As you knock, the door will swing open. As you ask, you will receive. Do you have faith like this synagogue ruler? Do you have faith that sends you looking for Jesus? There was likely a moment in your life when you gave your life to Jesus, when you put your trust in Jesus... It was a day when you surrendered your heart to Jesus and you went seeking Him and when you found Him, you found salvation. And so now, now will you seek Him for the other circumstances in your life? Will you seek Him for healing, for wisdom, for strength, for peace, for finances, for courage, for direction, for encouragement? Will you have faith to believe like you did when you received salvation? You didn't question whether God could give you grace for salvation. Why question Him that He couldn't give you all of these other things if you would seek Him first? This father said, if I can find Jesus, my daughter will live. He travels down the road looking for Jesus. He looks ahead and sees a great commotion in the road in front of him. Dust is rising from the road as crowds of people begin to surround Jesus. He hears children's voices and people shouting and rejoicing. There's a lot of excitement coming from the great company of people surrounding Jesus. And all of the people are delighted because Jesus is There and they have found Him. This is a great picture of what church should be like. Church should be like this. Church should be a bunch of people, crowds of people seeking Jesus. Crowds of people worshiping Him. Crowds discovering Jesus. Tears of joy and celebration as God intervenes on people's behalf. Tears of desperation as people seek Jesus with their needs. Shouts of celebration. Songs of worship and praise. People coming from all around just to see what Jesus is doing. And this father, he finds Jesus and he's able to get through the crowd. You ever question that? How did this guy get through the crowd so quickly to Jesus? Well, it's because he already has a reputation. This guy already has a solid 
reputation in the community. He is a synagogue leader. He is somebody that's well respected in his town and in, in his city. So when he goes looking for Jesus and there's crowds of people, when he shows up, the people say, hey, look who it is. He wants to see Jesus. Let him through. Let him have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. Not everybody got that kind of attention. And so this guy gets all the way to Jesus and notice the response. Notice his position when he finds Jesus. Verse 22 says, Seeing him, he fell at his feet. This leader did not lord his position over Jesus. He did not bargain with Jesus. He didn't demand anything from Jesus. He didn't try to use who he was as a way to manipulate Jesus. Instead, he surrenders to Jesus. May I present to you this. The Father's response to you is dependent on your surrender to the Son. You'll be hard-pressed to go through the Gospels and not find a person who was healed by Jesus who didn't respond in this way. You're going to be hard-pressed to find a person that wasn't freed from something that didn't come to Jesus in this way. In Mark chapter 5, in the beginning of the chapter, you're going to find a man who was tormented by demons. And when he found Jesus, the Bible says he threw himself at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus freed him from those demonic forces. When the prostitute came to Jesus, what did she do? She put herself at Jesus' feet and washed his feet with her hair and Jesus forgave her and she found mercy and grace. You want to get the Father to respond to you? Position yourself and surrender to the Son. That's what moves the Father's heart. You can't demand to the Father and say, you know what, I'm a Christian. There's promises in your word that say that I get these things and try and demand anything from Him. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's ruler of the universe. Your demands don't mean anything to Him. You know what perks His heart? You know what perks His ears? You know what He responds to the most is your surrender to Jesus. Your positioning your heart to surrender to Jesus. God wants to meet our needs, but He needs us to surrender to Jesus. This father and leader put everything on the line when he threw himself at Jesus' feet. It was more than a desperate cry to heal his daughter. It was a complete surrender to Jesus. This was a public statement in front of his friend to work for their popularity and their reputation. And here he comes through the crowd and throws himself at the feet of Jesus. You don't just do that. I mean, I didn't, you know, when I was greeting people in the hallway today, I didn't see anybody like run through the hallway and just launch themselves at anybody's feet because they were excited that they were there today. I didn't see like uh, uh, any, any spouses who drove separately today. I didn't see them like come in, oh, honey, and throw themselves at their feet. Feet. I didn't see that today. I'm sure you were excited and wanted to, but uh, it didn't happen. And, and so you can imagine why they don't do that, because it's just embarrassing. And here this man is, this religious leader who is living in a time and day where the religious leaders are not real fond of Jesus. They don't really like Jesus at this point. They don't like the attention He's getting. They don't like the direction He's taking the Jewish people. And here He is going and saying, I am a religious leader. I understand what my occupation is. I understand where my money comes. I understand what society thinks. And I don't care anymore because I am desperate to find this man who can change my situation. And He is the one thing I am now putting my faith and trust in. And if that means I lose everything else I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ he surrendered everything and his position depicts his complete surrender to Jesus and why did he do it because he believed he believed in Jesus and believed Jesus was who he said he was and that he could heal this man's daughter and so the question becomes for you and I, to what point do we believe? 
Do we believe just enough to receive salvation? Or do you believe enough to totally surrender? I believe what you receive is not just in proportion to what you believe, but it's also in direct proportion to what you surrender. I think you can believe what's in this book, the Bible, and stand on its promises and demand things from God because they're promises in Scripture and watch nothing happen. I've seen it preached, I've seen it taught, I've seen it prayed, and it doesn't work. And I've asked God oftentimes, why isn't this working? It's in your word. What is happening here? And I found this revelation that God is looking for more surrender. You know, that's why we find people who you say, how come every time they pray for somebody, they see these people get healed? How come they experience so many blessings in their life? Well, I think if you dive into their lives, what you're going to find is a person who surrendered more than most. A person who gave up more than most for Jesus. A person who sacrificed certain worldly desires in their life for Jesus, a person who sacrificed time and energy for Jesus, a person who gave up worldly desires for Jesus, a person who sacrificed in their life for Jesus. And because of their sacrifice, because of their surrender, they experience more of the kingdom. It's an access point to the heart of the Father. But it's a difficult point as well. Because sometimes it's just easier to just take our salvation in Jesus Christ and add it to our utility belt as an extra thing that, you know, chalks up as like a good thing in my life. Like, I got success in my career. I got a good marriage. I got a good wife. And oh yeah, I believe in Jesus too. And so put that on my belt. It's a good thing. I got that too. It's excellent. And it seems good and great until the marriage starts to fall apart, until one of the children gets sick, until the career gets ended, and then the financial things are, are no good anymore. And then it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Where's that thing I put on my belt? Jesus, I know you're here somewhere. What's that promise you made to me somewhere, Jesus? All the while, the Father's saying, I wanted you to surrender that marriage. I wanted you to surrender that career. I wanted you to surrender your kids. I wanted you to surrender everything to my son, Jesus. And if you would have surrendered everything to the son, then I would have added all these things into your life. It's a kingdom principle. We come under surrender to Jesus. It's a surrender to the Father when we surrender to Jesus. So how do we position ourselves in surrender? Well, remember that the Father is looking at your heart. So as He looks at your heart, where it is in position in regard to Jesus, He's looking and He's saying, where is your heart in regard to Jesus? Your heart, it's the center of who you are. It's where your passion is, your dreams are, your deepest desires it's where your greatest value is. So the Father examines the heart to see where Jesus is. And I think as He's looking at your heart, He's saying, is Jesus on the throne of it? Does He rule it and run it? Is He in charge of those desires and dreams and passions? How is my heart positioned to Jesus? I was listening to a sermon uh, uh, this just a couple of days ago, and the pastor said in this, this was... So good. He said, your body is the temple of God and your heart is the holy of holies. Jairus put his whole heart on the line. He was bringing a need of the heart. His daughter was dying. He deeply loved her and was passionate about his family. He was risking a lot to come to Jesus. He was risking his career. He was risking his reputation. And he takes it all and he lays it down at the feet of Jesus. He surrendered it as an act of faith. Verse 23 says this. He said this to Jesus. He said, my little daughter is at the point of death. And we got to ask ourselves, how bad does it have to get before we will surrender it all to Jesus? How bad does it have to get before we seek Jesus? Before we surrender it to Jesus? Is it not until we start losing control of it that we then want to give it back in the hands of Jesus and hope to gain it back? 
We can learn from this guy because it didn't have to get to this point. Mark 5, 23 through 24, he says this to Jesus. He says, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Here's the good news. This same Jesus who was there for him is here for you. And it doesn't matter how long you've waited to come to Jesus and seek Jesus. Jesus is an incredible individual who loves you passionately and he still comes with you to save the situation. Jesus is an incredible, incredible loving God. I'm going to just read the rest of this story and then, um, and then we're going to close things out. Verse 24 says, A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her daughter, Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Here is a woman who doesn't have the status that this leader had and so she can't get to Jesus. In fact, she's got this sickness that that in that day and age would have made her unclean. It would have meant that she wasn't supposed to have contact with people. She was supposed to stay in her home. She was supposed to stay out of the crowds of people in case it was contagious. And, and, and so she wasn't even supposed to be in the streets. And so she's trying to hide herself, her, her identity. But she knows if I can just get to Jesus, if I can just seek Jesus, if I can just touch his clothes, I'm going to be healed. And so she pushes through the crowd, she sneaks through the crowd, she gets just close enough and she touches Jesus and her faith heals her and Jesus realizes that power has gone out of him and he says to the crowd, who touched me? His disciples say, come on Jesus, people are touching you all, the, all over the place. You know, there's all these people in here, they're pushing up against you. What are you talking about? about you know and, and and you know we don't want to start any fights here you know what are you talking about and Jesus says no somebody touched me with faith somebody touched me in a different kind of way somebody was seeking me in a different kind of way we can have crowds of people that come to church and 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 just kind of go through the motions and want to see what Jesus is doing and then there's those individuals who are seeking Jesus looking for a touch Will you push through the other things in life to seek a touch? And you might say, well, I'm nobody or, uh, uh, you know, you don't know my past or you don't know, you know, uh, people will think I'm weird or people will think this, that and the other. Listen, Jesus is no respecter of persons. This woman thought all of those things and when she pushed through the crowd and she reached out for Jesus, Jesus healed her. He healed her because Jesus loves everyone. No respecter of persons. But she sought Jesus. And then notice her response to Jesus is she surrenders to Jesus. She kneels at his feet. Verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But the people, they laughed at him. You need to understand in this day and age, if you had somebody that passed away, it was not uncommon for you to pay to have mourners come to your house. 
people would actually be paid to come and wail and cry and mourn for the loss. And, and so somebody who is di- in this position of leadership uh, and, and losing a daughter, you know, it's important that he had all of these people mourning the loss of his daughter. So he would have had hired people come to, to cry and mourn. And so here's these hired people mourning and crying and wailing and making a commotion. And Jesus comes and says, what's going on here? You know, the girl's not dead and they laugh at her that's how they're able to make that switch and laugh at him instead of getting mad at Jesus for saying this they laugh at him and so Jesus eventually gets them all out of the house we don't know if he kicks them all out we don't know if he he calmly says okay I need everybody to leave all it says is once he is done getting everybody out of this house It says, he, after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Verse 36, Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe just believe you know if we could go back to the basics and just believe believe like this woman and like this father who put it all on the line to seek Jesus they surrendered it all to Jesus and not just when we need something we can't just surrender it to Jesus not just when our daughter's sick or we're sick not just when life throws us a curveball but every day every moment seeking Jesus what would life be like? Could the promise in Matthew chapter 7, 7 through 8, actually be true? Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. You know, it's going back to the basics of our faith seeking and surrendering to Jesus. Let's put that into practice this week. Let's allow seeking and surrendering to be a part of our daily routine. I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to open up these altars because the reality is this. The same Jesus who was there for these individuals is the same Jesus who's here for you today. And you could believe for your healing. You can believe for your restoration. You can believe for the blessing that you need. And I believe that that same Jesus will move on your behalf. If you're willing to seek Him and surrender your life to Him. I believe that moves the heart of God. And that's an awesome pattern. Is when you seek Jesus, you surrender to Jesus, it moves the heart of God. And through the Holy Spirit, He moves on your behalf. It's an incredible picture And that promise is here for you today. And I believe that. Would you believe? Would you stand to your feet? And we're going to close in prayer. And we're going to open these altars. And we're going to ask the prayer teams. The prayer teams have their prayer badges on. They're going to be available to pray for you and encourage you and stand along beside you. And these are people who uh, uh, we are holding accountable that they believe what they're praying. These are people who are seeking Jesus on a daily basis. And they're seeking Him because they believe that God can move on your behalf. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, I know that You're here in our midst through the Holy Spirit. God, I know that just as that leader sought You, hey God, there's people in this room who are seeking You. God, I, I, I know some of the stories. I know some of the situations. And Lord, there's many individuals here who have uh, uh, loved ones at the point of death. They have loved ones facing disease. They have loved ones, Lord God, who are uh, pursuing just a, a, a lifestyle, Lord God, that leads to death. And so, Lord, we're going to stand in the gap for those ones today. And God, we're going to seek Your face for their healing. And we're going to seek Your face for, uh, for, for a special touch on them. Lord God, for a realization of the salvation they need to find in Jesus Christ. Lord, we're going to seek You. But Lord, we're not just going to seek You. We're going to surrender to You. 
We're going to take the things in our lives, our dreams, our passions, everything that matters to us, our heart's desires, and we're going to surrender to them, to you. We're going to take those things and surrender them to you. We're going to place you on the throne of our heart. We say, God, I'm just going to pursue you. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe your plan for the situation. I'm going to take you by the hand and you're going to walk me through this life. Every trouble that comes, Jesus, you're going to walk me through it. You're going to be with me. You're either going to fix it or you're going to take me through to the other side. And so, Lord Jesus, I just pray right now. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come rest in this place. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you begin to meet the needs right now in this place. Holy Spirit, come, minister. Be faithful to the promises in your scripture as we seek your face. Be faithful, Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you if you have a need. The prayer team, I'm going to ask you to come first. Just go ahead and step out of the aisles and go ahead and make your way to the altars. But if you have a need, I'm going to ask you to just really seek the face of Jesus today. It's never, never too late. It's never too late. Seek Him. Seek Him. Would you seek Jesus today? And then this week, would you seek Him and surrender? Surrender to Him. I mean, imagine what could happen. Just imagine what could happen if we just seek Jesus and surrender to Him. Amen? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Tyler.